My, uh, my message this morning is called, What is Christmas? Seems like a generic title, I know, but, I, but it's what the Lord really has, has led me to, uh, to have us talk about. And, 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 it's, and genuinely, I just want to say, Merry Christmas. Because I love Christmas. I, I just really love Christmas. I love that in the name of Christ, we do all the fun stuff that we do. I mean, we do all these wonderful things in the name of Christ at Christmas time. This last week, I took my mom up to, uh, I don't remember, the Christmas light show way up on the north side. What's that? No, no, no. No, not the zoo, the one on the north side. <sighs> Alum Creek, thank you very much. We went to Alum Creek. That was awesome. Um, th- yesterday, we had a big party at Dad's house, and uh, everybody was there. We had all this food and just playing games and hanging out. It was just kind of, we were just having early Christmas. In fact, this week, I gave my kids a, a, a present or two early. I just couldn't. I had to. I just, I had to do it. <laughs> I just, I'm just, I love Christmas. I love all the stuff we do for Christmas. I love it. We're, some of us are going to go caroling. We went caroling a week ago, and we're going to go caroling tomorrow. If anyone wants to go caroling, you talk to me. Me and a group of people are going to go caroling tomorrow because I just love it. Because only at Christmas can you knock on someone's door and just go, we want to sing worship, worship songs about Jesus. And they accept it. And they go, thank you. They love it. I really do. I'm going to try it sometime in July. We're going to go knocking on doors and just go, we want to sing worship songs. Is that cool? You know? <laughs> I know Billy wants to try it with me. We want to do summer caroling. But I love that. That's why I really, I really encourage you, you know, just tell people Merry Christmas. Just, just, just celebrate Christ. But the truth is, is Christmas gets lost. The true meaning of Christmas, it does. It gets lost. Doesn't it? I, one of the things I love about Christmas is the Christmas specials. You guys like watching the not the and I was not the tear jerking, you know, Hallmark specials. <laughs> All right, I'm not big into the tear jerker ones. I like the kids shows. <laughs> I do. I like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, Frosty the Snowman, Prep and Landing. The truth is. is the, I watched these before I had kids. <laughs> I just, I like, I, the truth is, is I like cartoons. I do. I like cartoons. And I enjoy these. And so, and one of my favorites is Charlie Brown. My wife and kids hate it. It's they, 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 they do not want to watch Charlie Brown with me. It's too slow for them. There's no robots or laser beams. It's just Charlie Brown, and it's kind of a slow I don't know what it is. I think I grew up with it, and so I just love it. I, and I do, but there's something, and it's so takes us back to the question because Chuck, Charlie, Charlie Brown in the, in the cartoon, he gets lost. It becomes about a Christmas pageant. It becomes about Christmas trees and Christmas presents and letters to Santa and he feels a vacuum, he feels a hole. And, a, and, and, and the whole cartoon kind of climaxes at this moment where Charlie Brown says, Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And Linus, the thumb-sucking, blanket-carrying little boy, comes out and says, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And he reads from the scripture. He reads Luke chapter 2, which is actually where we started this morning. We're going to be in three scriptures. If you want to turn with me, uh, you can turn to uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 2 right now. Verse 8. This is what Linus reads. And I'll just let you know that I love this. That even when this, was, uh, when this was written in the 70s, they were really unsure about reading the scripture on TV. But they would never get away with this today, right? But I mean, but they, there was a lot of pushback. I was reading an article on it. As they read the scripture on television. And this is, this is what, what he reads. And in that same region... There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I'm bringing you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, 
There was an angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. It seems so familiar. We hear this every, every time we watch the Christmas shows, every time we watch Charlie Brown, and every Christmas we dig out a few of these passages and we read them, and we go, oh, that's what Christmas is all about. It's all about Jesus. But I think the truth is, is that he's still lost. We go, oh, it's about Jesus. He's that little, the little baby, that little figurine in the nativity that's almost lost under the tree or on the mantle or behind the presence. Oh, yeah, it's that Jesus. That's what it's all about. It's about that Jesus. But he's still so lost. And so today, if I actually thought about naming this message uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas Part 2. <laughs> because I really want to go deeper. Yes, the answer is, it's all about Jesus. If you want to know what Christmas is all about, it's about Jesus. But who is Jesus? Who is this little baby? Well, I mean, who is this little baby born in this, in this little nativity that's under the Christmas tree? And I want to go to two less likely Christmas passages. John chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 20. You can get your fingers in there. All right, um, and because uh, the question is, is who is this Jesus? Is he a teacher? As the Muslims believe, a prophet? Maybe he's an angel, like the Jehovah's Witness believe. Is he a created being, as the Mormons believe? Was he just a nice guy? As a lot of people believe? Who is this Jesus? All right, Christmas is about Jesus. It's got his name on it. He's all over it. But who is he? Let's look at what the Bible says. What does the Bible say about who this Jesus is? John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made. I'm sorry. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. See, the scripture says very clearly, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The word was God. The scripture says, John very clearly says, he wants to jump. If you jump down to verse 15, he, said, he, makes it, he just makes it very clear. He says, you want to know who the word is? Verse 15 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God. That's what the scripture says. The scripture says Jesus was God. So God left heaven and came to earth? Well, yes and no. Absolutely. Jesus is God and he left heaven. And yet God didn't entirely leave heaven because we, we understand in the, in the scriptures, we understand a, a plurality of God and a singularity of God that we admit doesn't make sense. <laughs> we just admit it. In Genesis chapter 1, and many times in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 1, you don't have to flip there, but you may if you want, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God says, it says this, it says, then God said, God, singular, then God said, let us, let us make man in our image. And we all go, what? <laughs> you know, if you start referring to people or referring to yourself as we, <laughs> people will worry. <laughs> They'll go, how many people are in there? Exactly. Right? But God refers to himself as us, our. We understand that Jesus is part of God, part of God that became man. See, Christmas is about God becoming man. In fact, there's no way to read the book of John and not see the message, Jesus is God. Let's look at, I'll just show you a couple scriptures. I think I have these on a slide, yep. A couple scriptures on what Jesus said. So we'll go beyond what John said. Let's look at what Jesus said. Jesus said in the book of John, John chapter 8, verse 58, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham, 
before the father of Israel, a long time ago, he said, I am. Jesus said, I am. And don't, don't, don't mistake what that could mean. He was like, well, he's just saying that he's a person. He exists. No, no, no. He's saying, I existed before Abraham. I existed before I existed in this flesh. And the Jews knew exactly because the Jews knew the story of Moses. And when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? He said, tell them that I am sent you. Jesus said, before Abraham, I am. And that's a theme in the book of John, if you read through these great I am statements. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. Every time he said this, people didn't have any, they didn't have any mistakes. He was saying, I am God. Let me show you a couple other scriptures. This is the one that you, that uh, if a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, you, you go, what do you do with John 10? <laughs> because they don't believe that Jesus is God. They believe him to be a prophet, all right? All right, Jesus, uh, Jesus says in John chapter 10, uh, John chapter 10, verse 30 says, I and my Father are one. And then they want to stone him, and they, sto and they want to stone him because he it says, it says, because you make yourself God. You're saying that you and God are one, what do you do with that? You can't deny it. Jesus said, me and God, we are one. Jesus is God. Let me show you another one. John chapter 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Revelation 22, verse 12, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me. I will repay each one for what he has done. I am, again, all the way in the book of Revelation, Jesus is still saying, I am. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There's no doubt that Jesus is God, God who has become man. That's a question, though. The next question, I think, we all ask, well, why would God become man? What, <laughs> why would you do that? Really? And especially, I mean, really, let's be honest. If, would you make yourself, I mean, you might, some of you might say, I'd like to be a few years younger, amen? Remember a few of us? Raise your hand. Is that you? You go, I, I'd be a little younger, sure. You know, I'd like to be 25. I'd like to be whatever, some age where I, I could do things that I can't do now. And I know most of you feel that way. But let's be real. Who here would say, I want to be a baby? Anyone? Anyone want to wear diapers? Like, you go, that sounds great. Let's wear diapers and let's eat mashed peas, right? Like, nobody wants to do, like, who would go back to that? Why would God become a baby? Why would he limit himself? No one would do that. We want to be great, right? We want to be, we want to go, all of you, when I said that, you all say, I want to go back to the, like, the best age, right? The most healthy age that you have existed in. You, I don't know what year that was for you, but it's like, I used to be able to run 10 miles. I used to be able to lift 3,000 pounds. I used, to, I used to be able to eat an entire cow, right? I mean, I, I'm looking at Tyler because Tyler has such an appetite, it's crazy. <laughs> but I, I don't know what it is for you. You would go back to this and you go, I, I, at that point in life, I could do this. But none of us would say, I'll be a baby. That's entirely dependent on others. Why become human? Jesus actually answers this question in Matthew 20. And I hope you have your Bibles. Because this is, to me, it's the most unlikely Christmas passage. But it is the reason to the question that we all have. So we know Christmas is about Jesus. And Jesus is about God becoming man. But why become a man? Why do it? Why bother? You're God. You can do whatever you want. I love this passage. It, again, it's not a Christmas passage, but it answers the question specifically. So two disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, <laughs> right? That sounds like something that uh, I was, when I was a kid, my mom used to call me a tornado, 
<laughs> Tornado Tim. This is what they called me. Literally, I had this terrible na- nickname. And these guys, were they had a similar name, the Sons of Thunder, <laughs> which meant they were full of themselves, all right? That's, that's what the Sons of Thunder. And so they get mama, and I'm not going to read the whole passage. We'll, we'll, you can kind of read it later. And, and they get mama, and they come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, we want to sit in heaven. We want to be first and second. In heaven, we want to sit on your left and on your right. We want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. That seems like a great request, doesn't it? We want you, we want you to come to come to church and, and just say, hey, everybody, I want to be first at church. <laughs> in the kingdom of heaven, me first. That's what they said. And Jesus answers the question. First of all, he says, no. <laughs> That's not how it works. He says, you, you don't understand. So I want you to look at verse 26. Verse 26, 27, and 28, this is where he answers. He answers their question, but he also answers our question of why become man. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever, whoever would be great among you, you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. He says, you can't, it can't be about you. You want to be first, he says, you have to be last. This is something Jesus teaches over and over and over again. It's that great upside down kingdom. It's it's those that serve, those are the great, the great ones. And those that make themselves first, Jesus says, they're last in the So look what he says, and he says, I am your example. Verse 28, he says, even the Son of Man, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus came to serve. So there's there's half your answer. Why come as as a human? Why come as a baby? The answer, he says, he says, look, Jesus, I came to serve. I came to to serve. I didn't come so that Pastor Tim could serve me. I came to serve Pastor Tim. I didn't come to church today so that I could serve him. I came to church because Christ wants to serve me. Christ came to serve you. That's a hard thing to, to accept, isn't it? It really is, because we want to serve him. We want to serve him, and we don't think it's right. How is it that he would serve me? But he says, I came to serve. And this is why he came as a baby, because he can relate to children. No matter how old you are, he says, I I remember what it was like to be a teenager. I remember what it was like to be a child. He can relate. He came to serve. You know how I serve others? How do you serve others? Think about that for a second. How do you serve others? You do stuff they like, right? Yeah? You know how I serve my kids? I get on the ground with them. I get on my knees with them. I wrestle. This is what my boys want to do every day. They want to wrestle. Daddy, will you wrestle? I don't always want to wrestle. I, just, I, don't, I don't feel like wrestling every day. But I want to serve my boys. So I get on my knees, even when I'm tired, and I wrestle them around, and I tickle them. I watch the shows they want to watch. I read the books they want to read. I play the games they want to play. I get on my knees with them, and I'm serving them. I do the same, and you do the same with people that you love. Your wife, your husband, your friend, how do you serve them? You do something they want to do. My wife wanted to watch Annie, the new movie Annie. We went and saw it. And I told her at first, she said, let's go see Annie. And I was like, mm, I don't want to see Annie. I, I, I actually like the story of Annie. I just, you know, 
I've got two five-year-olds, and good to go to a theater and sit there. And I was just like, this is going to be a hassle. Let's just rent a movie. We'll get, I'll watch a haul. You know, I just didn't want to go. And then, I, and then I felt bad about it. And I said, you know what? You want to go. I want to serve you. Let's go. And we actually had a good time. I fed my, my son, David, had to eat the entire two hours, <laughs> just throwing jelly beans at him, blah, blah, because it's the only way. I mean, he's five. How are you going to make it through? You know, he's, he's laying across the seats. He actually likes it because he loves musicals. So he was into it, but it, only as long as I was feeding him stuff. Um, <laughs> but that's how we serve. We serve by getting on their level and doing things they want to do. Understand, that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus got on the carpet. Jesus got down so that he could relate to you. He became man, God in the flesh, so that he could serve you, so that he could be near you, so that he could teach you love, so that he could teach you holiness, so he could be the example of it. Aren't you thankful for that? That Jesus isn't that God didn't just dem demand these, these, these qualities of love and service and all these things. And he didn't do it just from heaven and go, you should be this way. No, he became the model for us. He served us. Jesus, who became man to serve you. Secondly, there's two answers in verse 28. In this unlikely Christmas passage, not only did he come to serve, but if we read the whole passage, the whole verse, it says, even as the Son of Man came to be served, I'm sorry, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life as a ransom. A ransom. A ransom is a payment for life. You may have been watching the news recently, and you may have heard the story of the, the jihadists that took all those hostages in Australia. Did you read that? He lost his life, and they lost a few hostages. And usually when someone takes hostages, the idea is they, they take some people hostage, and they, and they say, all right, I want, uh, I need a million dollars. No, make that like $10 million and, you know, a bag of chips and, a, you know, a train or no, not a train. We want a helicopter to Tahiti, right? That sounds good. All right, that's what I need. You know, this is what, this is what, the, the, this is what the terrorist, the hostage taker does. They say, I'm putting a price on these people's heads. A ransom. And see, what Christ said, Christ says, look at what he said. He says, to serve and to give his life, my life, to give his life as a ransom. You may not know it this morning, but you're a hostage. You're a hostage. Not to some evil organization. Not even to the devil. We are hostage to ourselves. We are hostage to sin, to our own sin. See, the scripture is pretty clear. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's everybody. All. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's you and me. What's a sin? Just breaking one of God's commandments. There's, I mean, we've all done it. Told a white lie, that's a sin. Coveted. We look over coveting, don't we? We don't think coveting is really a sin, not in America. We don't, I mean, we do it every day. We look at the guy's car. We look at the guy's computer, their new doodad that they're sp scrolling through, and we covet. We want what they have. That's, the Bible says that's sin. The Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 is very clear. It says, and the wages of sin. It doesn't say the wages of 10 sins. It doesn't say the wages of really bad sins. It says the wages of sin, all of them, any of them, the wages of sin is death. We are hostage. We are hostage to sin. And the payment they want is your very life. 
That's the ransom. Romans 5, 8 is so beautiful. It says that why God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? So while we were still sinners, think about what that means. On your worst day, not on the day you dressed up for church. <laughs> I mean, on your worst day, the day you did the worst thing you've ever done in your whole life. And everybody in their mind, you, you're going there. You know, and I know, I know the worst things I've done. I mean, you just have to think about it. And it goes, there it is. I got a top 10 list. The worst things I've ever done. The Bible says, on your worst day. On your worst day, he died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for you. He paid the ransom so that you could go free. That's what Christmas is about. Christmas, Charlie Brown, Christmas is about God becoming man so that he could serve you and so he could save you. That's Christmas. That's the message of Christmas. And it's an awesome, awesome thing. And the only question to all the Charlie Browns in the room is, is there room enough in the inn? Is there room enough in your heart that you would receive him? Is there room enough for you, for this Jesus who became man to serve and save you? I just want to ask that we bow our heads in prayer and just allow.